Surgery has come a long way from the days of cutting blindly into the body. Through questionable practices and dutiful grave robbers, people learned more about the human anatomy, and the hacking and sawing of surgery past moved towards refining motions, developing skills, and extraordinary technological advances. In the 21st century, there are two frequently used methods of surgery, laparotomy, or open surgery, and laparoscopy, minimally invasive surgery. In this presentation, I will discuss the benefits and drawbacks of each type of surgery. But before I begin, it is important to understand the physiology of the human healing process. Healing of muscle or tissue is a three-step process. After the trauma occurs, the body undergoes hemostasis or inflammation to stop bleeding, proliferation to regrow cells, and finally maturation in which the wound closes and scarring can occur. Inflammation is often visibly characterized by swelling, increased temperature, and pain. It occurs approximately zero to three days after the trauma has occurred and is one of the most unpleasant stages of healing. But there is more going on than meets the eye. The increased body temperature recruits leukocytes and macrophages to destroy bacteria and clean the wound of all cellular debris. Cytokines motivate and organize cellular activity and growth factors encourage cell replication and healing. Because many different cell types are required for this initial process, the blood vessels also dilate, allowing more room for the cellular activity to occur. During proliferation, there is a lot of activity at the trauma site. Fibroblasts from the blood move along fibrin threads to produce immature collagen, which is laid down in the wound, forming a matrix known as the extracellular matrix. Macrophages promote the formation of new blood vessels, and new capillaries grow into the wound bed from the endothelial cells of the damaged blood vessels so that the healing wound now has its own blood and oxygen supply. The resultant granulation tissue is not strong, but increases in strength as the capillaries reduce in number and the clot dissolves. Wound contraction begins to occur once the wound is full of granulation tissue. As myofibroblasts are produced, they penetrate the extracellular matrix and pull the wound edges together to close it. The final phase is maturation and it occurs once the wound has fully closed. This phase involves remodeling of collagen, resulting in fibrosis or scarring and scar tissue formation. In humans, the collagen in the granulated tissue no longer forms in striated or layered patterns. Instead, the collagen strands line up head to tail, which reduces cell signaling. This is one of the reasons why a scar may feel less sensation and why the tissue will only regain approximately 80% of its original strength. As forementioned, today we use two types of surgery, open and minimally invasive. Laparotomies, or open surgeries, require making a long incision to open the cavity. This long incision enables the surgeon to have a larger range of motion and allows the surgeon to access hidden or precariously oriented organs and tissues. This type of surgery is ideal for patients who have a lot of scar tissue from previous traumas and surgeries, patients in which internal bleeding issues are expected, and patients in which multiple organs require attention. Open surgeries such as these have been used as far back as the Middle Ages, and although we now have the advances of sterile environments, anesthetics, and highly advanced patient monitors, the large incision still requires a longer hospital stay, as the body begins the healing process not only on the affected organ, but also along the incision site. The incision also leads to a larger scar, which can cause later medical issues or personal issues of insecurity depending on the location. The large scar is also a prime target for bacterial infection. The idea of minimally invasive surgery dates back to the time of Hippocrates, when he refers to the use of a rectal speculum. However, this method of surgery could not take off until the late 1900s, when the first solid-state camera was developed. Minimally invasive technologies have continued to advance in most recent years, and there are many procedures in which minimally invasive surgery has now become the standard. Laparoscopic surgery requires small incisions to be made in the abdominal wall through which laparoscopes can be placed and through which instruments can be maneuvered. The process normally involves inflating a patient's cavity with carbon dioxide gas, allowing for more space for the surgeon to work, and it proceeds by the surgeon inserting various snipping, stapling, and cauterizing instruments to repair or remove organs. This type of surgery is ideal for lung surgery candidates 
as the ribs do not have to be separated, and has become procedural for many gastric and colon related surgeries. The benefits of this type of surgery includes less pain, a smaller chance for infection, a shorter healing time, and a shorter length of stay in the hospital, as the body no longer has to deal with a large wound, but instead with a small incision. All of these reasons would seem to indicate that minimally invasive surgeries are more beneficial, but unfortunately that's not the case. Laparoscopic surgery is not feasible for all procedures, and the limited field of view provided by the laparoscope can lead to more internal damage if the surgeon is not well trained, or if the organ is located closely to or underneath another vital organ. There is also the high cost of these instruments. To give you an idea, the typical cauterizing pencil used in almost any surgery is about $7 per pen, but a minimally invasive stapler costs about $300 per instrument. And in a typical lung lobectomy, approximately seven staplers are used per surgery. While minimally invasive surgeries tend to be cheaper than the open procedures overall, this is only due to the money saved by a shorter length of stay in the hospital, not because the instruments are cheaper. Recent research has also indicated that the carbon dioxide lessens the release of cytokines, which play an important role in wound repair. This can actually slow the healing process or extend the proliferation phase of healing. Now you may be asking, is there any evidence that one is safer than the other? As far as mortality rates are concerned, a study looking at mitral valve repair reported that there was no significant difference between open or minimally invasive surgery mortality rates. Recent studies have also noted other benefits and drawbacks of each type of surgery. For example, while minimally invasive mitral valve surgery has improved numbers in atrial fibrillation, chest tube drainage, and sternal infections, it also has a higher risk of stroke, aortic dissection, groin infection, and phrenic nerve palsy. So is one procedure really better than the other? No generalizations can be made as to whether all surgeries should be minimally invasive or if all surgery should be open. Instead, many factors play a role into a surgeon's decision as to which would be better for that patient. For example, if the patient has a cardiac disease, they should not perform a laparoscopy because the carbon dioxide used in the inflation of the cavity usually causes an increased heart rate. In addition to these factors and many others, the factor that is most important and overlooked by patients is the training of the surgeon. As medicine has become more skill-specific, surgeons usually specialize in either laparotomies or laparoscopies. The surgeon untrained will rarely opt to do the minimally invasive surgery and will perform an open surgery or refer the patient to another surgeon if possible. Hopefully you now know more about the benefits and drawbacks of these two types of surgeries. Don't forget to check Blackboard for the quiz. Thanks for watching!